Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Rhetorics of Freedom, a conversation about the condition of Black life in the age of the American Revolution, part one. I'm Turkaya Lowe. I am supervisory historian for the National Park Service, and it is a pleasure to join you tonight. The National Park Service partnered with the National Council for Public History in 2001 to sponsor five conversation at upcoming NCPH annual meetings in preparation for the coming 250th sesquicentennial anniversary of the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. In 2021, we began our partnership uh, with a panel discussion by Indigenous women. Um, proud to say that two of our um, Indigenous uh, staff members at the National Park Service participated in a conversation on Indigenous histories and memory in Alaska, Hawaii, and the Indigenous Plateau. In 2022, we explored the identities that were created by the American Revolutionary War exploring how the Revolutionary War not only created a new nation, but created new identities, new borders, and new realities for both American, British, French, and indigenous inhabitants of North America. So tonight we continue the conversation, uh, the first of a three-part conversation that we will continue at uh, the uh, in-person meeting in Atlanta. Um, and we'll begin with a discussion by our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much for joining us tonight um, with, your, with your expertise, with your thoughts. I'm looking forward to the discussion and the Q&A. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. My name is Sylvia Hollis, everyone, and I have uh, worked alongside NCPH at NPS to pull together this a group of esteemed panelists. And the first question I have for folks is going to be essentially an opportunity for us to introduce ourselves to you all. Uh, I, I, when we convened a couple months ago, I posed the question, why did you say yes? <laughs> and I think that's a great opportunity for us to introduce each other um, to, to the audience and also for us to kind of center our purpose uh, to this project into the program. So I'll go first. <laughs> My name is Sylvia Hollis. I'm the Assistant Professor of African and African American History at Montgomery College, which is in Rockville, Maryland. And I said yes, because I deeply believe in public history. And it is uh, one of the first places that I, I came to when I first started thinking of ways to learn about the past. It was historic sites. It was um, not necessarily uh, historic sites that were formally recognized as sites, but sites that had uh, substantive meaning to my community, um, that were um, oral histories and stories were often being told about these various landscapes. And um, I had the esteemed pleasure and honor of uh, being a Mellon postdoctoral fellow um, and gender and sexuality with NPS uh, during 2018 and 2020. And so I was in the process of, of, of that, that, that postdoc, I had opportunity to work um, and meet a lot of people within the field, frontline staff. And it introduced me to some really important ways to think about the work beyond the way that I traditionally thought about the work. And so I'm here again, because I'm very excited about the opportunity to engage with practitioners, folks that do the work. Um, so with that being said, uh, I thought it might be nice for us to go in alphabetical order based off folks' last names. Um, I imagine that's a thing that people are used to at some point in your lives. So uh, Dr. Eveline, <laughs> we're coming to you next. <laughs> Sure, thank you all. Well, good evening. Hi, my name is Evelyn Alexis. I'm based in Ohio, even though I am a New Yorker. And I work at Oberlin College as a historian in the Africana Studies as well as Comparative American Studies departments. And I said yes, because both the topics of rhetoric and how we represent, as well as freedom are so pertinent and central to my own fields of study, as well as my teaching about the African diaspora in the United States, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean. So thank you. Thank you, Aista. Oh, you're, you're muted, Aista. <laughs> Oh, 
All right. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, so my name is Isaac Clark. Um, I'm the former um, director of the old Slave Mart Museum here in Charleston, South Carolina, and I currently am the um, cultural history interpretation specialist for the um, Charleston County Parks and Recreation Commission. The reason I said yes um, is because when it comes to um, sort of unspoken um, narratives, um, I talk enslavement all day, every day, um, from sort of pre-colonial eras, um, you know, with the various European powers, as well as a lot of the connections to, you know, modern day. Um, so a lot of it is both very prescient and very present. And so when it comes to things like, you know, the word freedom, what that means and how that's changed over time, both in terms of, you know, ancestors and then also, you know, you know, modern, modern folks. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Maya. Good evening, everybody. It is so rare that I have two people go before me alphabetically. I'm always usually first with the last name starting with D. Thank you, Evelyn and Aista. Um, I am here in Washington, D.C., um, and I work at the Riversdale House Museum, where I'm the director. Um, and my museum is at a crossroads, and so I felt like I did not have an option to say no. I had to say yes, because my museum is really at a phase where it's trying to transition and transform the messaging around, the rhetoric <laughs> around what it is and the stories that it's going to tell. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to highlight the work that we're doing and then also be in conversation with these scholars and other museum professionals who are also doing this work because, you know, it's all about connecting our stories and tying it to the present. And I think this is the perfect opportune time. Awesome, thank you so much. And, and Marcus. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for facilitating tonight. And thank you, Dr. Hollis, uh, for convening us. Uh, I am Marcus Nevius, uh, currently Associate Professor of History at the University of Missouri in the History Department and in the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy. Uh, I said yes because I wrote a book that was published by the University of Georgia Press a couple of years ago uh, about the human history of the Great Dismal Swamp, about slavery and uh, the rhetorics of and realities of petite marinage, Black resistance in the swamp. Um, and in the years since the book was published, the three years now, where has the time gone? <laughs> I have uh, had the privilege really of engaging with a wide ranging audience of people who find value in the the histories of black black people, black resistance, black history, uh, far and wide from subjects we know like Frederick Douglass uh, to subjects that are a bit more obscure like the several thousand enslaved people who worked, labored, whose labor was exploited over 80 or so years in the history of the Great Dismal Swamp. And so I love any opportunity to share that story and to share more broadly uh, in conversations about the power of public history, uh, especially as it's informed uh, by recent studies that are shaping history as we know it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm particularly excited about this panel because of the diversity of approaches and also the various ways that there's, there is a through line of passion to this theme, but we're coming at it with um, different textures that contribute to, to the conversation and, and hopefully in a way that will make, uh, that will demonstrate <laughs> how, how open and important the topic is and, 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 it, and as a capacity for us to think about a, a longer chronology. <laughs> and so what we'll, what, what, the audience will find is the, the chronology of this topic for us won't necessarily stay focused in some, you know, 1776 to 1789 kind of narrative, but that is that is there and the legacy is there. Um, and, and sorry, I'm in history professor mode, so I'm pulling back out. <laughs> and I'm going to go uh, to something that I think has also brought us all here, including the audience members, a love of history. And so I'm very curious um, what brought you to the field of history? Why, what, what are your earliest memories of, 
of, of falling and when you think of falling in love with like the idea study in the past or what or, or the material from the past what was it for you all as individuals and sorry uh were some of those initial interests in any way shaped by public history spaces museums monuments uh, historic sites i'll take that the crack at that one first because i love that question the answer is yes i'm from new brunswick <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey was known, may still be known, as the crossroads of the revolution because of the fateful events of 1776, uh, from New York in the Northeast to Trenton and Princeton and eventually Philadelphia in the Southwest. Uh, and it was as a kid attending schools or in a school district that had schools like George Washington Elementary School or Lord Sterling Elementary School that uh, an understanding of that history was around, uh, sort of was planted as a seed. But it wasn't really until I went to college that um, I actually began to think of history as a profession. I was an undergraduate at North Carolina Central University, and I will do this everywhere I go, just in case there's anybody who attended an HBCU in the room. <laughs> um, e uh, But it was in conversation with the teacher scholars uh, who were on faculty uh, in the history department and frankly, several other departments where I actually began to really think about the work of a scholar when I became interested in the work of a scholar. And it's frankly in Durham, North Carolina where, where I found the history of the Great Dismal Swamp to be fascinating. Uh, I took that to uh, the Ohio State University, OH. <laughs> um, and I continued the passion for it and I really take the passion for where I go. Uh, so for me to be an historian is as much to be a human in the room, uh, to try to engage people in the stories as much as it is about the facts and the timeline and the argument. Well, I'm happy to go next, Sylvia. Um, I, I know we discussed this earlier on, but really, I think I have a non-traditional way that I first became interested in history. I first became interested in history uh, through my family. Like, I, I just think being young and hearing those stories from my grandmother and her sisters, my great, I've been fortunate to live, you know, with great grandmothers um, and like going to family reunions and you know, I have to remember being young and every year we'd have these family reunions and uh, my grandmother and her siblings would get up and tell their stories and my aunts would say, oh goodness, here they go again. But I was like so intrigued by that and the stories that they were, I was probably the only person genuinely interested in this reunion and these stories. But even that, I mean, like, and thinking about like my mom and my grandmother having a hair salon and growing up in an environment where people are like communicating. So I think that social aspect of, our lives and the people that I didn't know who had passed on before I came in is really what started to lead me into history. And I think I can say that now in my 40s, I don't think I knew it then. But as I think back on it, it was the one thing outside of dancing, because I am a former dancer, that I loved. And I knew that as I entered into work, I just could not, I didn't have it in me to do something that I didn't enjoy. And so I knew that you know, if I'm going to do this, I have to be passionate about what I'm doing. And so I took that with me wherever I went. And then also being an HBCU graduate, you know, like history is deeply entrenched in the work that we do. Um, I attended two HBCUs, Claflin College in South Carolina and Howard. I am a Howard Vice. I have, I have a, a vice and bias, Marcus. Um, but, you know, like, being entrenched in those spaces where, you know, history is something that's tried and true. Yes, you know, <laughs> um, I, I see that in the chat, but it, it is something that just has set with me from, um, you know, being young and being around family and, you know, seeing things like a copy of Roots on your table, you know, you know, it's like a Bible. So there's all those little elements of historic moments that you see over time um, that start to really shape who you are and how you're, career has developed and transformed. So I'll leave it there. Aista? Yeah, I guess I'll go next. Um, <laughs> um, so how to kind of, I suppose the place to start for me was um, with my maternal grandfather, who was a, um, who taught at 
for Marcus um, Hamilton High School in um, uh, in Central New Jersey. So he may know that area, maybe not, um, for like 30 years. And when he retired as one of the oldest grandkids, um, I kind of spent summers in from, you know, went from Florida where I was, uh, where I was living for the first 10 years of my life up to um, upstate New York. So it was a culture change to say the least, um, to see mountains, to see old trees, to see um, fresh water that wasn't filled with alligators. Um, and in a lot of ways between, you know, driving around with him to various washes of quartz and granite um, and looking at old um, bases um, of mills and other things and him quizzing me at five, six, seven years old and saying, what's down there? What's man-made? What's not? Um, you know, as well as painting old signs, um, those are old historic markers, you know? Um, as well as just helping him with an old um, revolution. I think it was sort of colonial dig site for an old um, cemetery and tavern that had existed. So that was an interesting thing. And he was an am amateur archeologist. He was an amateur astronomer. Um, he had done lots of things. So for me, it started with geography first. Um, you know, I, I even like to say for folks that geography is the mother of history, because if you can understand geography, you can understand everything else, um, because people tend to like fresh water they can drink, um, as well as, you know, making communities in different places. Um, and things sort of, you know, kind of blossomed from there. I went on a fairly significant um you know, Japan and East Asian kick in my um, sort of middle school days. Um, that's a whole other thing. Um, and then, you know, as I got older, it I came to it from a sociological, anthropolo anthropological and economic view as well. Um, so, you know, getting into the numbers and then getting into the people and the numbers and how that all both changed and didn't change. And then looking at it from a lot of simultaneous things like what's happening, you know, kind of putting all of those pieces together. Um, and because, you know, I, they pay me to talk about this stuff <laughs> and, and really interact. It's, it's really fun for me. It's a really enjoyable thing because I'll get scholars on a regular basis. I'll get, you know, just little kids. I'll get, you know, folks who, who come to who come to the, the various spaces that that I've worked and they say, oh, I'm here to learn what I didn't learn in school, um, and for a lot of that, that can be really interesting because you can see it viscerally on their faces. Oh, you know, when the light bulb goes off, when you know things have shifted, and then conversely, sometimes there are those people that are incredibly resistant to the truth and the knowledge that's coming out. So. Um, I guess I'm more in the trenches than not these days, but that's okay. Um, and Marcus, I definitely want to read that book. <laughs> I'm really excited. So, all right, I, that's it for me. Uh, otherwise, I'll talk for the rest of the hour. <laughs> so oh, thank, thank you. No, this is that's a wonderful full so, uh, circle moment. And uh, Evelyn would love to know from you too. Definitely. I love how, I just love listening to you all and thinking about how for many of us, family and community, our other family um, is so central to how we came to this field or arrived on it. So for me, it also was hearing my own family recount proudly of how they're Haitian and the successes of the Haitian revolution. And so that was something that was, you know, on repeat <laughs> consistently in family discourse and community discourse as well. I also was thinking about how as a kid, although born in the United States, observing how so many ways that history played out in my eyes in the form of people migrating from Caribbean and in Latin America, to spaces like Brooklyn, New York and all over New York seeking refuge and how communities welcome them in the face of very challenges. And I think about their own stories of migration but stories of survival and hardship, et cetera. And then one of the things that also collectively shaped my interest in going into the field 
of history was my older sister and my one African-American teacher in elementary and middle school. I had one, <laughs> despite being in a very Black district. They introduced me to the writings of apartheid very early on. And the story is of African-American girls coming of age in the history pages and the literary pages of Mildred D. Taylor. And I think about how collectively all of these stories um, and sense of community and belonging and perhaps not belonging for other people, you know, motivated me to tell stories, document stories of the past significantly. So, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, my, my next area I'm going, I feel like we've spent a little bit of time here already, but I would love to revisit it so we can um, um, excavate what's, <laughs> what remains, you know. Um, uh, when, when you think of places now. So there may be historic sites or places in general, places could be grandmother's porch, right? <laughs> that, that framed our way of, of, of our first love of understanding the history and culture of the past. Um, what are the ones that are most important for you now in your current work? Are, are there historic sites? Are there museums? Are there memorials that shape your current work? Um, what are they and how? are they shaping your work? And, and how do you see your relationship to those places right now? Um, for me, it's actually fingerprints. So it's been a passion project of mine, she's almost a decade now, um, going around Charleston, as well as any old brick I can find um, in Savannah or um, in Miami or, um, you know, Boston and New York and, you know, really anywhere is looking for enslaved fingerprints because knowing both the work that, that took, knowing the timelines in which they are doing that work, knowing, you know, a lot of it is children and, and women um, and how that interconnects and how that's one of those things that people can walk by hundreds of thousands of millions of times over time and not necessarily know them but the importance of that both to, you know, the, the literal built environment um, and the way that that, and, you know, showcasing that to people in various places is, is valuable. Um, not just for me, because, you know, I like to nerd out about these things, but also for people from other parts of the country, um, other parts of the world, to see that in both a very tangible way of, a link to the past, but then also they'll look at their own spaces in a different way. They'll look at their own cities in a different way. They'll look at their own towns in a different way, possibly. Um, and so that's really enjoyable. Um, I like to joke that every time I go to a new area that has um, any kind of exposed brick, you're going to have to add another 30 minutes to whatever we're doing, because I'm going to slow down to almost not moving, looking for fingerprints. And usually I find them. And so that's always a really enjoyable thing for me and whoever I'm with, ideally, because they're like, what? You know, I've walked past this, this bank, you know, hundreds of times or thousands of times or, you know, this office building or this colonial era and get a sense of it because it's not just something that happened, you know, in Charleston and Savannah where there was a lot of clay, but also a lot of these bricks were you know taken via a ship to New York or to Boston or all of those sort of coastal places to build these cities and both during the era of the pre-revolution and then definitely after the revolution you know they gotta you know they're gonna use fire a lot of fireproof structures and so it it pulls people into a very both past and present mindset of you know we did this we did this and so to be able to link that tangibly to something that they understand, you know, especially, you know, when we look at really little fingerprints, because then it's like, oh yeah, you know, I've got kids or I've got grandkids or great grandkids, and this is tangible to me. And so, you know, working, because I mean, the concepts are the concepts, right? You know, we can talk about nebulous things, but to be able to put your finger in it definitely is heavy. And, you know, but it's also enlightening. So those are things I enjoy. That's it. I think so I can... Go ahead. No, I'm going to... <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say, I think I can jump in here because I, 
I'm really of two minds as I think about a response to that question, right? Uh, because for me, uh, I think of extant cityscapes or places where there are monuments like uh, Ista says, like uh, Ista says, uh, Boston, for example. I've lived in Rhode Island for the last six years. Uh, so Providence, uh, especially Benevolent or Benefit Street uh, is one of the places that has uh, a sort of 18th century uh, pre Civil War era aesthetic that institutions like the Rhode Island Historical Society work consistently to maintain to some degree. Uh, but then I think about how I've been positioned since my work has come out. Uh, I've been uh, a part of conversations, uh, for example, about the Great Dismal Swamp and perhaps uh, the creation of a new site in the swamp. And so the other way that I consider this question is to look at landscapes that still need recognition, uh, places where uh, history took place. Uh, and for me, especially that's places where uh, enslaved people uh, occupied space to consider. Uh, it's, for example, the Great Dismal Swamps is to me a last frontier on the East Coast of recognition in some way, uh, but it's also right there in the middle of the long Chesapeake history, which dates to the 16 teens, or frankly, the 16 aughts, uh, the recent watershed, 1619, uh, set aside for a moment. And so I consider some places to be places of opportunity for recognition. Um, and I'm attending uh, more intently, I think, uh, at this stage of my career to those potential places of recognition. Uh, I should mention here, also the great efforts in the state of Rhode Island to put together and to be linked into the broader national port markers project. There's uh, somewhere between four and six projects here that are seeking to establish public sites of commemoration. There's one in Newport, there's one in Providence, there's one in Bristol Warren, for example, uh, where medallions will be placed in public view that commemorate the history of the transatlantic slave trade and its centrality to Rhode Island economy, but also the long dark history of exploitation of people of the African diaspora uh, by the rum men of the 18th century. And so I, I really think of that question in, in two very distinct buckets, I guess one can say, uh, because there's what we know and there's what has become grand, such as the Embrace uh, statue in Boston, which was recently unveiled, or what I suspect will come. Marcus, if I could, um, I, I, I've, for people that may not know exactly what the Great Dismal Swamp is, um, we, I understand you've historicized it. You've placed it within a context of its significance over time. But what, what is it as a place, and why did it become a part of your research? Uh, the Great Dismal Swamp is a huge tidal basin, <laughs> which at um, its largest geographic expanse, according to a number of scholars, uh, covered about 2,000 square miles in Southside Virginia, east of uh, what is today the line between the counties to the west of the city of Chesapeake and running back toward what is today uh, Virginia Beach, but what used to be uh, Princess Anne County. Uh, it used to extend as far north as uh, some reaches of the Elizabeth River and the southeastern portion of the James River, and as far south as Edenton and the Albemarle Sound uh, in North Carolina. So essentially, uh, geographically, it's this really large space that has um, spaces that are above the water table uh, to about 10 feet. Locally, they're called hummocks. Um, and spaces that remain submerged, not necessarily under salt water, but under um, highly acidic tannin colored waters that are uh, more characterized by leaf fall and peat buildup than they are uh, the clear waters that we would think of in some common lakes. Um, and it's a place where as early as the turn of the 1600s into the 1700s um, has been targeted for uh, various forms of natural resource extraction, uh, the earliest of these companies to succeed being the Great Dismal Swamp Company, 
uh, which began in the 1760s. Well, I should use succeed kind of carefully uh, because the enslaved people, the company sought to exploit, resisted at every turn, uh, and essentially sank the first vision of the Dismal Swamp Company before it actually became, in its later iteration, um, a successful timber extraction company. Uh, and so the swamp today is much smaller because it's been drained over time. Uh, it's been uh, bisected and trisected by first canals and then railroads. Um, but it also has this really rich human history, which is connected to uh, the people of Southside Virginia who have lived in those counties and the people of Northeastern Virginia, uh, North Carolina, who have lived in the swamp adjacent counties for generations. Thank you. Do other people feel comfortable sharing um, the historic sites yeah. and current work? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know where to jump in. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't cutting anybody off. So for me, as I think about um, spaces, I I was sitting here listening to everyone. The one thing that kind of sits with me is I'm thinking about the places that I've visited, the places that I've worked and the places that I plan to go. And so in terms of like thinking about like visitation, um, the one site that has really shaped my work and impacted my work for a life is visiting uh, Cedar Hill, the home of Frederick Douglass. And my first time engaging with that space, I was in the third grade. And like, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was the one museum that stuck with me more than any other um, and probably speaks to how figuratively like he's been in my work. Um, and so as I think about that space and then, you know, like 35, 40 years later, you know, working on projects to make sure that we uphold his legacy and memory in the state of Maryland, uh, where he's a native son. Um, and so, you know, like that, it like Frederick Douglass oddly shows up in almost everything that I do, no matter where I go, um, every iteration of my career, he's always shown up uh, from my first job out of college at the City Museum of Washington, D.C., um, you know, and, you know, getting an opportunity to kind of work with uh, Douglas there and become like more familiar with who he was uh, living in the city. And then that then carrying over to my work at the Maryland State Archives, <laughs> where we researched the study of the legacy of slavery in Maryland, and then working with state partners um, to make sure that we can kind of find a way to honor him in the state, uh, whether that be through a, a museum that's still in the works and in the talks and in the parks of his, the places where he was born. Um, and then bring in statuary, like physical representation of Douglas in the highest building in our state in Maryland, uh, the Maryland State House to have that representation there. And so my career, having had that early engagement with Douglas's home, it made me steadfast in my energies to make sure that I dismantled every moment of you know, not wanting to have black voices at the table. Um, you know, like, I, I can't say it any clearer. Like there's a lot of other um, minorities that we advocate for in our state, uh, but more than any other uh, group in terms of representation and museum work in our state and on a national platform, uh, celebrating the lives and the legacy and contributions of black people has been the biggest challenge. And so having, gone to that space and seeing someone, a figure like Douglas, celebrated in the same way that we would celebrate Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, James Madison at Montpelier, George Washington at Mount Vernon. Frederick Douglass had a place that was just like that, where you have like 75 to 80% of his original items from his lifetime on display, uh, faces that look like yours and create a sense of belonging, hanging on the walls, uh, Blanche K. Bruce, like I remember that picture <laughs> being in the home and having the wherewithal to have interpreters who tell that story so well and never tell the exact same story twice. So I've carried that with me and it really helped shape my career and where I am at Riversdale. Um, we have a loose connection to Douglas uh, through Adam Francis Plummer, who's enslaved at my site. Um, his son, Henry Benton Plummer, Frederick Douglass actually put his name forth to be the first black army chaplain. So, you know, like it, it's something, it's been a common thread that shaped my work and it makes me steadfast uh, coming into Riversdale presently. 
it's the place where I um, am having one of the greatest challenges is dismantling sharing that story. We, for many years, for the first 29 years, uh, which will be 30 in June, we have told a single narrative for many years and left out the voices of the enslaved population, uh, let alone the uh, free black workers who were hired to work there um, and the indentured servants. So it really has been important for me to continually to push the envelope, which I've done for over 20 years now um, in spaces that traditionally were not made available to interpret the lives of black people in this country. Even Lane, any thoughts? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> no, I was thinking about for me, like uh, doing this work involves all my senses, right? And I oftentimes think about doing research in the Caribbean. I employ their methodology of how history is a tangible functioning entity, right? So how do I hear from people? How do I see them? How do I smell the landscapes, right? That tells me about the freedom seeker who was a maroon, who ran away, or looking at a bill of sale, or looking at newspapers that document freedom seekers' actions in the form of infanticide, running away, um, organizing civil rights movements, and then into this contemporary uh, lens of how people create parks and monuments, but also also use murals and graffiti for activism. So thinking about like all hands with all senses are on deck in a way that makes it accessible, but also facing the reality that for many black people across the Americas and brown people as well, that history sits side by side with you, whether through oral stories or through these spaces that, that you're consuming or producing specifically. Yeah. Awesome. I want to uh, share our, our last question, uh, and as I as I read it, I want to say for folks that may have questions um, beyond the ones that have, that I, that have been um, you know pre curated, please please use the chat and or um, post within the the um, the moderators uh, box your question. I do see. I want to acknowledge there is one that came in, but I wanted to make sure that we um, kept the flow of the the program as it is, and then we'll definitely get to your question if you're in case you're, um, you're waiting. So the last question is, um, consider the forthcoming 250th anniversary of the American Revolution and your current work. Um, what does the phrase rhetoric of freedom mean to you? And in many ways, we open with that question, um, but I also know that there's more uh, that you all do within this, this topic that, that I would love for you to share with the audience. I can make mine very succinct. I know when I thought of the word, it made me think about reparations, reparations in the form of education, access to land and access to markers of wealth and health. I'll try, Eveline, to do the same, be succinct. Um, <laughs> I think about the primary source that has vexed me for quite some time. Um, it's, it actually forms the epitaph that is uh, part of the title of my book, City of Refuge. It's an article that was published in the early 1850s in the Liberty Bell, um, a magazine that circulated in Boston. But it's about the Great Dismal Swamp. Its author writes about the Great Dismal Swamp. And instead of doing as Frederick Douglass and others had done, cite slaves in the swamp. Edmund Jackson in 1852 says there are Maroons in the swamp and their activity reads to me like people in Santo Domingo, Haiti, and Jamaica more than it does people in other parts of the American South. And so this city of refuge uh, really stuck out to me as a form of a rhetoric of freedom because Edmund Jackson in 1852, an abolitionist whose brother was more famous than him, was citing the action of freedom and the freedom seeking that others had reported in the Great Dismal Swamp for a number of years. And so as I think about the 250th anniversary of, of the nation's founding, I think of this space at the center of the old dominion as being central to the lives of the people who we recognize for other things. There are many famous characters who have come through the swamp, no less famous than George Washington himself. Uh, and a few enslaved people who knew the experience of work laboring 
at Mount Vernon, but also in the Great Dismal Swamp. And so I really think about these connections that we don't otherwise draw when I think about rhetorics of freedom, and especially when I think about the 250th anniversary of the war that we are soon to commemorate. Thank you. And, and Marcus, if I could just contextualize for people, in case people do not know what it is to be a Maroon or what that means in reference to previous rebellions, um, essentially in Haiti, but not as, as it was called at the time, right? So what what is what is uh, my, I'm country, so <laughs> I call it Maroonage. <laughs> Other people say the French version. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and why is that? What does that have to do with this reference that you made in case people aren't familiar with it? I love you bringing the audience into our conversation a few days ago about how in Alabama, it's maroonage, but frankly, that's the English pronunciation for uh, a form of freedom seeking, which was very different than pursuing freedom by way of the Underground Railroad, for example. Um, and it had transatlantic dynamics. So, Maroons sought to claim spaces of land, and these could have been swamps, these could have been mountain hollows, these could have been uh, defensible uh, geographies, rival geographies, as the late historian uh, Stephanie Camp once called them, uh, where in certain cases, communities were able to be established and sustained over time, uh, and where in other cases, the hiding out lasted for as long as the freedom seekers sought before they returned uh, to slavery's landscape um, for various reasons. The most famous uh, instances of marinage uh, generally took place in either Jamaica or Haiti uh, and were made famous because of the freedom seekers efforts as maroons to maintain the landscape that they had established. And Jamaica has a very well-documented history today, for example, of Maroon towns whose descendants still live on the space that their ancestors uh, wrested from or occupied or seized, depending upon the viewpoint, uh, from colonial authorities, efforts to project into the mountains of Jamaica their authority. Um, I could go on for days, but there's, I think, one more important point to make, which will kind of sneak back around to the linguistics. Uh, the scholar Gabriel Debian um, in the mid 20th century gave us a language and a concept for this form of freedom seeking when uh, he cited it as marinage and when he cited um, two forms of marinage, petite marinage and grand marinage to sort of signify scale. Um, and more recently, scholars have problematized that binary. Uh, but it really is essentially the action of resisting enslavement to be free and succeeding at that that is the common thread uh, that we understand as Maranash today. Fantastic, thank you. I'd be remiss if I didn't say um, last month was Black History Month and the theme for Black History Month was Black resistance. And so a part of the rhetorics of freedom um, also requires a, a constant acknowledgement of Black people's uh, striving to resist enslavement, right? That was all omnipresent, uh, the original intellectual framework for abolition, right? So um, any, anyone else wanna share uh, how, how you're considering this 250th anniversary and what, it current, what this rhetoric of freedom means in the context of your work? I'm happy to chime in. Um, as I think about the rhetoric of freedom, I think about the space in which I sit, which is, at the Riversdale House Museum. Um, it sits in a county that was once the largest slaveholding county in the state of Maryland um, from approximately 1820 to emancipation. And today, you know, presently it was touted uh, in the last uh, 15, 20 years as the wealthiest black county in the United States. And it's just like, wow, like how do we get to this place? Uh, but, you know, it's not one straight path to this rhetoric of freedom um, and the way in which people uh, claim freedoms for themselves. When I think about the work that I'm doing and the challenges that I face from individuals who you know, made decisions over time to set a social hierarchy for what's important in museums um, and, and how we are still suppressing uh, the stories of individuals who were actually held in bondage for an, a, a number of years um, in our state 
uh, specifically at Riversdale and other properties associated with the family members of the individuals who own the home where I work. Um, you know, for me, it's all about dismantling uh, that hierarchy. We don't have to do that through modern music and practice um, and thinking about the rhetorics that we put forward about who we are. You know, it's okay to say that, you know, Rosalie Steercower, who owned my home, she threw a mean party and she had great style and taste, but she also enslaved individuals and they suffered under her hand greatly. Um, we, we have to acknowledge that. And, you know, I, I ask people all the time, you know, if I enslaved people today, would you really care how well I dress? Would you really care if I threw a great party? Would you really care whether I, you know, made the best peach cobbler in Maryland? You know, if someone had told you that I enslaved people, would any of that matter to you anymore? So I think we have to look at that and understand and, and step away from those none of us were there uh, narratives that we like to tell people. Um, I think that's one of the rhetorics that has uh, carried forward. And you know, while none of us were there, I think on all sides of this, that all of us have been a recipient of the legacy of slavery in this country. Um, and just because my skin and identifier is African-American today, uh, those same individuals who actually uh, built upon that rhetoric of freedom in our country, I'm descended from those people as well. So I, I can call out and I can celebrate and commemorate in the way that um, I see fit. And I just think that we, we have to do our best to tell a more truthful history um, and making sure that we own up to who we've been, who we in some ways still are and who we want to become in the next generation. Well said, oh, I still. Well, I ask this question to young people not infrequently. Um, we have got programs, you know, that essentially called the dawn of freedom. So talking about um, what it was like during the area of Reconstruction. Um, and I get interesting answers. Um, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, well, you know, to do whatever they want or to go wherever they want or to, you know, have all of these things. But then, you know, to, to, to contextualize how quickly that was snatched away, how quickly that was um, legislated away, how quickly that was um, sort of the system of, of enslavement just changed. Um, it went from physical ownership to economic ownership. And particularly at my, um, my main site, McLeod um, Plantation and Historic Site, where I have my office, we had, we have documentation of descendants of freedmen who lived in the cabins on site until the latter part of the 20th century, rather specifically until the summer of 1990, um, in structures that are 300 square feet in size, that lack plumbing, that lack electrical, you know, all of those things. And we frequently get people who will ask, you know, what, you know, why did they stay? Or, you know, how could they live like this? And you know, you struggle with it. You know, I struggle with it um, because there, there's the obviousness of okay, well, you know, you you can list off oh well, well they they were elderly or this is all they knew or all of these things, but the reality of it was was it was a continuation of a system, um, and so I look at a lot of this you know as a systems historian more than anything else of of understanding all of these linkages from this, this, in a lot of ways, mythologized past because, you know, because countries love, love their founding myths. They love them. Um, and so it will be interesting to see both in the, tw in the 250th, but then with, um, with Charleston specifically coming up on the three fifth um, of, you know, we're, we're coming up on, I think it's, you know, the 350th or whatever, because we were founded in 1670, not important. But, but how much there is a constancy of pushback of, oh, well, why are you telling these stories? Why are you talking about these things? Um, I mean, even getting markets, uh, even getting, you know, acknowledgments and, and placards and historic markers 
um, you know, is, is a wonderful thing um, here in Charleston, but not infrequently, we will get people who will visit and they will ask, where are all the black people? And we know with census data and a whole lot of other things that there's been, you know, a many, you know, a 200 or so percent decrease in, um, you know, Know, diverse um, populations on the Charleston Peninsula, on the islands around it. So in a lot of ways, you know, freedom becomes more, becomes harder to think about. It becomes, you know, trying to get out of systems that, you know, that have constantly kept you under, have, you know, everything from arrested you disproportionately to made your schools absolutely terrible to all of these things um and and also trying to remind particularly young people that it was not always this way that there are examples of not being this way and you know give them in a lot of ways hope that it won't always be this way that it didn't start with your moms or your grandma or your you know, great grandma, it started hundreds and hundreds of years ago, you know, these people that you go to these grand homes, and they talk about them with with a level of veneration, you know, owned a bunch of people owned hundreds, if not thousands of people. And that allowed them to extract the the through physical, you know, through, through the destruction of physical black and brown bodies, immense wealth that endures in various ways to this day. And so looking at those pieces and contextualizing that, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's definitely an interesting thing because, you know, talk, you know, what freedom means to different people may be something as simple as not continuing the cycle, you know, not, not carrying forth that generational trauma not carrying forth the the frustrations the the you know five ways to get out of poverty you know you know attempts to you know and and having pathways to becoming a professional historian becoming a teacher becoming an architect becoming you know a real estate mogul whatever it is but even just knowing that that's a possibility for you is freedom in a lot of ways as well so it's it's an interesting word to say the least. Thank you, and in, in your work um, at that site and those questions that you ask those young people helps to do that work. Um, helps particularly, it helps to ignite some questions that hopefully they continue to ask. Um, and if nothing else, you ask them there, um, which is a value. Um, historic sites and opportunities when they when they are seized. Serendipity is seized in a moment when the moments are seized. Um, so we have one question, folks, which is perfect because we have five minutes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the question is one really about language and and semantics, but I do think it is an intentional question that's worth considering. Um, uh, words matter and, 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 and our language matters. So essentially uh, the person says, this evening I heard quote unquote enslaved people. Um, and I'm curious about the use of the phrase as opposed to quote unquote enslaved black people or enslaved Africans. If the panelists can speak to this word choice, um, why have this word choice over the others? That would be great. I would say for me, um, I think that for two reasons, um, I use uh, and differentiate between uh, enslaved people and enslaved Africans. I think enslaved Africans are a very distinctive group and that over a period of time as this country is becoming American, uh, they too are stepping away from an enslaved African identity and becoming more Americanized over time. So I think there is a, a huge difference between those who have come over as uh, enslaved Africans um, in the early founding of the colonies here um, and those who were then generations separated from the continent of Africa and became more Americanized. Um, the second reason I use enslaved people because I try to remember and remind myself that uh, 
especially here in Maryland, um, indigenous peoples were also mixing greatly with uh, black people here in Maryland uh, for sure and many other states. And so I don't want to erase and be the cause of an erasure of the indigenous experience here um, in this country because you know enslavement impacted them as well. I, I think that's very well stated, uh, Maya. And what I would only add to that is uh, whether or not the um, terminology is enslaved people to think more capaciously about who was enslaved uh, or enslaved Black people to acknowledge the politics that enslaved Black people as a phrase. Um, want, uh, uh, compels us to, to think about. Uh, it is very important for us to consider the change over time that, for example, in the Chesapeake, in Maryland and Virginia, by the latter half of the 18th century, there was a self-sustaining population of people uh, who were second and perhaps third generation enslaved born in North America, born in the Chesapeake, as opposed to uh, who we used to call a scholar saltwater slaves uh, from uh, the primary sources, people who were brought over during the transatlantic slave trade, which by the way, did not end uh, in 1807, 1808, it just became illicit. Uh, and so there's always regional distinctions that we consider and one way to, to try to at least begin the conversation without the erasures uh, is to begin with enslaved people. Awesome. I want to, uh, well, uh, I still, sorry. Yeah, um, I'll just pop in quickly and say the, you know, within the work, a lot of it, you know, using the terminology enslaved people versus enslaved Africans, one, you know, and I'm probably saying things that people have already said, I apologize, um, is also to make it sound really old and make it sound much more antiquated and not as much of a of a continuing thing of like okay they only brought over africans that was it they stopped in 1808 ish and then it was everything was great um and that is not the case it was never the case um and so that that continuum um as as uh ever others have said is absolutely um a major reason why you know even in the interpretive spaces we use the term enslaved people uh because it it, it loops in importantly those uh you know indigenous folks that were here long before as well as uh, the africans that were forcibly brought and then the africans that were rather literally bred once they got here um to grow that enslaved population so yeah thank you thank thank you everyone yeah. as well for your 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 care your purpose your intention and dedication to this this whole program, you all have been uh, amazing and incredibly thoughtful on this topic. Um, and I know you don't do it just because of this opportunity, you do it because it's the core of your purpose of your work. And so I just wanna take the time to say, I cannot wait for the continued conversation next month. Look forward to seeing and meeting uh, some of the people that attended as audience members virtually. Cannot wait to meet you all in person. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Lowe and Stephanie and Megan for this opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Too. Good evening.